Hi everyone. In this lesson, I'm going to explain different types of microscopy and staining techniques that we use in lab. So we're going to start this lesson or lecture out talking about different types of microscopes and why you use those microscopes, parts of the microscope and what their function is, and then staining techniques. So this is just a broad overview of these things. Again, this lecture is going to cover microscope parts and functions types of microscopes and different stains. When I see stains, I'm talking about when you look at a slide under the microscope, sometimes we stain cells that are transparent. So we use different, it's exactly like when you think of food coloring and we stain different parts of cells bacterial cells because we are in a microbiology class. So we're going to talk about those different stain types and the benefits of them. And right now I'm going to start with the microscope. So before I start out with the microscope, I just want to reiterate, I know that you guys in the first week or the first day of class are going to learn about microorganisms and what they are, but the easiest definition of microorganisms are any organisms that are micro or very small, so you can't see them with the unaided eye. Unaided eye means an eye that's not being aided by a microscope or helped by a microscope. That's purely the definition of microorganisms, is very, very little tiny organisms. And microorganisms and microbes, I'm just going to back away and say the difference between them. So whenever we say the word organism or a microorganism, organism refers to something that's alive. A microbe is, all microorganisms are our microbes, but not all microbes are microorganisms. And that's purely because viruses are microbes, but they're not microorganisms. Later on, not now, you're going to learn that uh, viruses are not alive. So we say they're microbes, not microorganisms. So just a little detail. And microbes or little tiny organisms include bacteria, archaea, fungi, protozoa, microscopic algae, so many different things. I just wanted to start off the microscope lecture just saying that these are microorganisms. They're very small and we need a microscope to see them because they're very small and you cannot see them with your pure eye. Like um, if you have, like I have my phone here, there's a ton of bacteria on my phone, but I can't see it because they're so small. And so this is where we get into microscopes. So just I just want to talk about units of measurement before we get into microscopes without overcomplicating it. So I know that all of you guys know that uh, the measurement of kilometers is very big um, and that meters are very big. But just to summarize, if we go from big measurements all the way to really tiny measurements, kilometers are very big. So um, in Europe and outside the US and all other countries, when they talk about driving, here we use miles, they say kilometers. So just know it's a big unit of measurement. Meters, you guys all know a meter stick. So a kilometer is a thousand meter sticks. And then a meter is just a meter. Centimeter, you guys know how big a centimeter is. You've seen it on a ruler. And then a millimeter is about the size of a point of a pencil. Now, these are units that are probably new to you guys. So if you take a millimeter, which you can see on a ruler, it's the little ticks on a normal ruler, and you divide that by a thousand times, the next unit we get is micrometers. And and bacteria are typically measured in micrometers. So again, to back up, a millimeter, the size of a millimeter is basically like the point of a pencil. Everyone can see a millimeter, you can see that. Now imagine if you take that and you split it a thousand times, that is what we call the unit of a micrometer and you cannot see that with your eye. Bacteria are measured in micrometers, they're that small. So that's why we use microscopes. Now, even smaller than a micrometer, if you divide a micrometer by a thousand times, is a nanometer. And viruses, we measure in nanometers. So viruses are generally much smaller than bacteria. So again, bacteria are measured in micrometers, and a micrometer is a thousand times smaller than a millimeter. So E. coli, which is a very common bacteria that we use for reference for a lot of things, is a couple micrometers meters long. Viruses are measured in nanometers and nanometers are a thousand times smaller than micrometers. Just as a reference, I don't want any of you guys to measure this, but because um, COVID-19 is a very prominent topic right now this year, um, the virus that causes coronavirus 
or COVID-19, that coronavirus SARS-CoV-2, and you'll learn about it later in the semester, is about 100 nanometers big. So it's measured in nanometers. Okay, now to get to microscopes. So when we look at measurements, so we talked about measurements, and if we go big to small, meter is very big, like a meter stick, and then nanometers are very small, we measure viruses in nanometers. Your eye can see up until the millimeter range, so the point of a pencil or the size of an ant. Anything smaller than that, you need a microscope. So the microscope we use is the light microscope. That's a typical microscope that you use in lab and just the typical microscope you see. It's not a very fancy microscope, but it does measure micrometer um, size. Now, bacteria, most bacteria are, are micrometers in length. If you want to see viruses, so the scientists that are studying like the HIV virus or the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which again causes COVID-19, um, there you're using electron microscopes. Electron microscopes are much more fancier than light microscopes and they measure nanometer length. So that's the take home message from this slide. And again, again, microscopes, we use them to measure small objects. So you use them to look at red blood cells, bacteria, this is what you would look at in lab. You are using white microscopes. So if any of you guys have taken anatomy, I know you look at um, blood cells in anatomy. So you look at red blood cells, you look at erythrocytes, you're using a light microscope. And again, when we get into smaller things such as viruses or structures within cells, so for example, like within cells, there are ribosomes. Those are very, very small. That's when we need electron microscopes, which measure nanometer sizes. So we're going to briefly talk about just the light microscope, types of electron microscopes. And I want you to know that there's more types of microscopes, but these are the ones that I want you to know. A light microscope is a microscope that uses visible light to look at things or specimens, so to look at organisms. And this is what a typical light microscope looks like. So we are going to go through the different parts of the light microscope, but just know the reason why it's called the light microscope is right here. So where, I hope you guys can see where my mouse is pointing, there's light. So when you actually turn on the microscope, that light turns on. And usually you put your slide here, so the light will go through, hit your slide, and then you can see it with your eyes. That's purely why it's called a light microscope. It's using regular normal light so that you can look at your specimen. It's the, and the most com there are different types of light microscopes. Um, the type of light microscope that you typically see or you use in lab is called the bright field light microscope. Sometimes we just say the light microscope, but it is a type uh, the specific type is bright field light microscope and it basically lets you see the specimen or the organism you're looking at evenly by spreading light evenly. The highest, uh, the highest total magnification that you can use with a light microscope is a thousand times. So if you're looking at a different like an E. coli bacterium or a salmonella bacterium or any other bacteria, the most you can magnify it is, is a thousand times. That's what total magnification is. So if you need to magnify something more to see it, you're going to use an electron microscope. And the resolution of a light microscope is 0 0.2 micrometers. I don't really care that you guys memorize 0 0.2 micrometers as a resolution, but we will talk about what resolution means in a little bit. Just know that if asked about on a light microscope, the highest magnification you can get, total magnification, is a thousand times. Now we're going to go through the parts of the microscope. So here, unfortunately, because of um, quarantine and everything going on, you guys are not in lab, so you cannot actually see the microscope. But I want you to try to understand it as best as you can by looking at a picture, because in your career, you will probably use a microscope. So right here where you actually put your eyes, we call that the ocular lens. And the ocular lens has an inherent magnification of 10x. So when you have you put your slide here, so let's say you have a slide and let's use E. coli. So there's different types of E. coli bacteria, but let's say there is a, a food poisoning going on, or maybe someone has a UTI, a urinary tract infection. 
and you take a urine sample and you put it on a slide and now you're looking at it under the microscope and maybe they have different, maybe they have E. coli bacteria that's causing the UTI. So you would put your eyes here on the ocular lens and without any other magnification, you will naturally see that bacteria at 10 times magnification. So the ocular lens has a magnification, a default magnification of 10x. The arm and the base, so this part of the microscope is called the arm and the bottom is the base. This is how you carry the microscope. So when you carry a microscope around in lab or in your future, you hold it by the arm and then you put your hand under the base. So this is the arm and that's the base. The objective lenses, so right here, these lenses that, shine, that um, you use, are called objective lenses. On the light microscope, there are four objective lenses with different magnification. This right here is called the stage. The stage is where you put your microscope slide. Then here you have this little piece under the stage. It's called the condenser. This is the part that focuses the light on your specimen. When I say specimen, I mean your slide. So your slide is here and the condenser is here. The light is here. The light will shoot up into the condenser. The condenser will focus light on the slide. On the, um, on the condenser, there is a diaphragm lever. So it's this little thing that you can move around and it controls the amount of light entering the condenser. The illuminator is just the light, which is right there. Here, there's something called a coarse focusing knob, which is a big one, and the small knob is called the fine focus knob. The coarse focus knob moves the stage up and down, so that's how usually when you put your slide, you wanna get it as close to the objective lens as you can, so you use the coarse focus knob. Then when you get really close to the objective lens, you start playing around with the fine focus knob, so this is when you wanna sharpen the image. And just to summarize how light passes, the light goes through, so here's the light source, it goes through the condenser, through the specimen, through the objective lens, through the ocular lens, and then you can see your slides. The mag so what magnification is the ocular lens? Again, this ocular lens has a just default magnification of 10x, so it magnifies anything by 10 times. Now, if you want more magnification, you use the objective lenses, and there are four objective lenses on your, mag on your light microscope. One is, there's 10x, th sorry, there's 4x, 10x, the one that you guys use in lab, and there is a 100x objective lens. And the function of these is to give you higher magnification. And I will talk about total magnification in a second, but just be aware of those. So let me get to that. Okay, magnification. So the objective lenses, so the typical microscope that you have in lab, the light microscope, just know most of them have four objective lenses, but you will see some light microscopes that only have three, but let's talk about the light microscope that has four objective lenses. And I'm talking about these right here. So the four objective lenses are 4X, that's the lowest magnification, then the next highest objective lens is 10X, then 40X, then 100X. So the, high, the most highest objective lens magnification is 100X. And whenever we use 100X objective lens, we do something called oil immersion, and I will talk about it. Total magnification is when you multiply the objective lens by the ocular lens. So ocular lens is always 10x. So if you were actually doing this in lab and you were looking at someone's urine sample at 40x objective lens magnification and I came to you and I asked what's the total magnification, you multiply this by the ocular lens magnification which is always 10. So 40 times 10 is 400. So the total magnification you're looking at would be 400 times. So there is a difference between magnification and total magnification. Magnification, when someone says what magnification are you looking at, you just tell them whatever it is that the objective lens lens is set at. Total magnification is the objective lens times 10x, the ocular lens. That's the total magnification of how big you're seeing your specimen. 
And when we look at bacteria in labs, so if you guys go on to be microbiologists or just anything that uses the microscope, bacteria are typically always evaluated at a thousand X total magnification, meaning that the objective lens you use is a hundred X. So again, if you're using a hundred X magnification, objective lens magnification, and I ask you what's the total magnification, you would do 100x times 10x, which is 1000x. Now we're going to talk about resolution. So resolution is resolving power, and it means the ability of your lenses, so your objective lenses, to distinguish between two points. The higher you, everyone, you guys all know this, so when new phones come out, they always typically have better resolution. So higher resolution means better image. That's all it means. So if you have an iPhone that has a very high resolution compared to an older iPhone, it means that when you look at the images, they're crisper, they're sharper, and resolution means that the lens can distinguish between two points with very little distance. So if we say the resolution is 0 0.2 micrometers, it means that your microscope can distinguish two points if they're 0.2 micrometers apart. So if we look at this image right here, this is an image of a cell, we can see that this, the left side is low resolution, the right side is high resolution. So higher resolution, the take home message of this I want you to get is higher resolution means a better image. And the definition of it is actually the minimum distance that can separate two objects. So when someone actually gives you a number of a resolution, like next time you go to buy a phone, ask them what is the resolution, that means the distance that it can separate between two points. So for example, iPhone 10, the resolution is about one millimeter. It means that that iPhone camera can distinguish two points if they're one millimeter apart. With our light microscope, the resolution is 0 0.2 micrometers or micron. Micrometers and microns are the same thing. I forgot to mention that. Okay, so with resolution, it's limited by the wavelength of light. So if you guys ever learned this in any class, light is a wave and there's wavelength of light. So because light is a wave, when it hits something, it can bounce off. And the reason I'm saying this is that with the higher magnification, so with 100x objective lens magnification, we have to do something called oil immersion. So that objective lens is very close to your slide. And the reason you have to use oil is because they're so close that when the light from the microscope hits, it bounces off because of the properties of light. And I don't want to get into the details of it, but that's why we use oil. And I'll show an image in a second. So Refractive index means that light bends and you can measure the amount of light bending. So the refractive index of oil and glass are similar. When you have, the reason I'm saying this is I did mention to you guys that at the highest objective lens, which was 100x, we always have to use oil or oil immersion. So if you were doing this in lab, when you get to that objective lens, I have a little oil dropper and I always tell you to put a little bit of oil. And the reason the reason we put oil is that we try to trap the light so that it doesn't bounce off. So without oil immersion, if you had your 100x objective lens, lens and then you had your slide here, the light comes from the bottom of the microscope, if you guys remember, and it will bounce right off. So you won't get a very clear image. But if you add a drop of oil on your slide, the drop of oil will merge between the slide and the objective lens, so you'll trap all the light and you'll get a very good image. That's why we use oil immersion with high objective. Now, the reason why we don't use oil with any of the other objective lenses is because there's a far enough distance that it's not gonna make a difference. But when you get to a very high objective, the lens is almost hitting your slide, so you wanna trap that light in. And again, oil immersion increases resolution at 100x objective lens, meaning you get a much better image and it prevents the loss of light rays. That's the whole point of why we use oil. So we finished now talking about um, 
oil immersion. Before we get to anything else, I want to talk a little bit about contrast with the microscope. So when we talk, when we, when I showed you the picture of the regular microscope, if you just take like um, a urine sample and you put it on a slide and you put it under the microscope, you're not going to be able to see all the organisms, especially if they're transparent or clear. So that's why sometimes we have to have some contrast so that we can see clear organisms. So most organisms are clear or transparent. Most bacteria are transparent bacteria. So if you have organisms that are transparent, like bacteria in a urine sample, you need to have some contrast. And you can either get contrast by using the microscope in special ways, which I'm going to talk about, or by staining your cells. So staining is not always desirable because a stain is a chemical, just like food coloring. So it could potentially harm the cells. It could change their properties. So if we want to just work with cells that are transparent, we might want to get contrast by using specific types of microscopes that give you this contrast. Two types of microscopes, of light microscopes that increase contrast are dark field microscopy and fluorescence microscopy. So dark field microscopy, if you think about it this way, if you have an organism that's transparent or clear and you put a dark background, you can all of a sudden see it. So just to back away, um, if I have a white background and I put something white on it, I won't be able to see it. But if I have an organism that's white and I have a dark background, I will be able to see it. So dark field microscopy is an excellent form of microscopy that we can use to increase contrast when we are looking at transparent organisms. So you can use dark field microscopy to look at an unstained urine sample. And you have not done anything to the cells. You haven't dyed them, you haven't stained them. All you did was put a dark background. So that's what dark field microscopy is. Fluorescence microscopy is another type of microscopy, and with this microscopy, you use fluoresce you use a fluorescent microscope, so it shines UV light, and you can see organisms that are naturally fluorescent. So, for example, in the ocean, um, like in San Diego Bay, there are some fluorescent organisms. If you take a sample of that water and you use a special type of light microscope called a fluorescent microscope, you can see fluorescence. Fluoresce you can also make organisms fluoresce by altering their structure. So these are two types of light microscopes that increase contrast. Dark field microscopy, which uses a dark background so that you can see transparent organisms, or fluorescence microscopy, which uses UV light so that you can see any fluorescent organisms. So with dark field microscopy, just to summarize, you put objects against a dark background. So if this is our regular bright field light microscope, you wouldn't really see contrast because if your organism is already transparent, it would be very hard to see. But if I use a dark field light microscope, I have a dark background, so it's much better to see transparent organisms. So you put an opaque disc, which means a dark disc in the condenser. That's how it works. With fluorescence microscopy, you use UV light and the fluorescent organisms will absorb this UV light and shine it back and you will see fluorescence. But you can also um, unnaturally, so artificially in lab, make or uh, add fluorescent molecules to organisms and use a fluorescent microscope to look at them, but this could harm the cells. So that's why we want to be careful with fluorescent microscopy. And usually when we do fluorescent microscopy on organisms that are, do not naturally flor uh, are not naturally fluorescent, you do kill the cells. So now we're going to talk about electron microscopes. So everything I covered so far has been the light microscope. So bright field light microscope, dark field light microscope, and fluorescent light, light microscope. Now we're going to talk about electron microscopes. So with, with the light microscopes, we could see things that are nanometers in, uh, sorry, micrometers in size. If we're trying to look at, if we're trying to study organisms that are smaller, such as viruses that are measured in nanometers, you need electron microscopes. So electron microscopes use electrons instead of light to give you a really good sharp image of things that are very small. And it's because 
Electrons have a very short wavelength, much shorter than light, so you get a much higher resolution and you could see things that are very small, such as viruses. You can get a total magnification of up to a million times with electron microscopes. Remember with light microscopes that the highest total magnification you can get is a thousand times. With electron microscopes, you can magnify something up to one million times. So the resolution is in nanometers, so it's a much higher, better resolution. And there is special preparation required, so these microscopes are very fancy, and this is why we don't see them in typical labs. The two types of electron microscopes that we're gonna learn about is transmission electron microscope and scanning electron microscope. And again, the total maximum magnification you can get from a regular light microscope is 1,000x. The total magnification you could potentially get with electron microscopes is a million x. So there is a scanning electron microscope and there's transmission electron microscope. To tell you the main difference, the scanning electron microscope scans the surface of an for example, a virus, and it can magnify it up to 100,000 times. Transmission electron microscope, actually, you actually look inside of a specimen. So you use a thin, a thin slice of your organism, and you can see inside of it. So you can look at organelles inside of a cell, and you can get up to a million times magnification. So transmission electron microscopes give you a 2D image and you can get a very, very high resolution image. Scanning electron microscopes, you're seeing the surface. So here, this picture right here, it's very small. I put it here for you guys. This is a electron microscope image of SARS-CoV-2, so a coronavirus. Um, this is not SARS-CoV-2, this is SARS-CoV, which causes the SARS disease. You'll learn all about these later, but I just wanted to show you that here we use electron microscopes. So again, scanning electron microscope shows you the surface of something. Transmission electron microscopes actually transmits electrons in the specimen. So we finished with microscopy, now we're gonna talk about staining. Um, with microscopy, the last few slides, I told you that a lot of organisms are transparent, they're clear. So most bacteria, most viruses are clear, you cannot see them. So when we talk about bacteria, a lot of times to study them, you need to stain them, to study them even further. Staining is basically any form of coloring that colors cells. That's all it is. And the purpose of staining is to look at organisms that are clear or to specifically stain specific structures. Um, and we'll, I'll talk about that in a second. So remember that unstained specimens have very little contrast with the slide. So if you wanna see them further, or if you wanna look at specific structures, like structures that make an organism move, you would wanna use special staining. And with, uh, whenever you stain a specimen, before you stain it, you actually have to get it on a slide. So I wanna go over this, how you prepare a slide to look at it under the microscope. So a slide is basically a little piece of glass. And what you do is, um, let's say someone has, this is actually a good example, someone has a sore throat and you wanna look at the, maybe they have a bacterial sore throat infection, not a viral sore throat infection, and you wanna look at it under the microscope. What you would do is you would take a sample from someone's throat, and if this is your slide, you would rub it on it. That's your smear. The smear is whatever it is that has your microbes in it. You would let your slide air dry or sit out for a little bit, and then you would fix your bacteria on your slide. Fixing means attaching the microbes to the slide. It's just a fancy term to say that you actually get them to stick on your slide. The way we fix microbes usually in lab is through heat. So you take your slide and you pass it through heat, pass it through a Bunsen burner, and this way the microbes attach to the slide and now you can stain them without worrying that they're gonna come off. The types of stains I want you to know after you've cre created a smear and you heat fix them, there are simple stains, negative stains, different differential stains, and special stains. So we're gonna go through each one. But just to summarize, a simple stain is exactly what the name is. It's just a simple stain, there's nothing fancy about it. A negative stain is a stain that stains the background. Differential stains are stains that differentiate one structure so you get either negative or positive, I'll talk about that. And special stain is everything else that doesn't fall into these three groups.
Okay, we'll start with simple stains. So a simple stain is just any basic dye that stains your cells. So if you have your cells on a slide, you could add, it's because you can think of food coloring as a simple stain. And what they do is they stain the whole structure and then you look at it under the microscope and you see, okay, there's bacteria present, yes or no. It doesn't give you any details, but you can at least stain something so that you don't get a transparent slide. An example of a simple stain is for example, methylene blue is an example of a simple stain. Negative stains. Negative stains are stains that stain the background. So some bacteria have something called a capsule. We will learn about this later. So here's your bacteria. Outside the bacteria, there's something called a capsule. A capsule is this gelatinous material that covers the bacteria. And so bacteria that have a capsule are very hard to except stain. So if I have a bacteria that has a capsule and I add a stain to it, such as a simple stain, it will not stick to the bacteria because of this gelatinous capsule. So with there's a type of staining called a negative stain. And with this stain, you use acidic dyes that do not stain the cells, but stain the background so that you can actually see your cells. So Negative stains are any stains that stain the background so that you can see, for example, a capsule on bacteria. Differential stains are stains that are used to distinguish between bacteria, so to differentiate one bacteria from one group of bacteria from another group of bacteria. So an example of a differential stain is a gram stain. A gram stain tells you bacteria, it either differentiates bacteria as gram stain positive or gram stain negative. Another type of differential stain is an acid fast stain. So cells are either acid fast positive or acid fast negative, and we'll talk about these. So a gram stain. A gram stain is a very common stain used in microbiology. So when you have a bacteria and maybe someone has an infection and you take a sample from their throat, or if they have a urine uh, infection and UTI, you take a urine sample and you want to give them the proper medication. We typically classify bacteria as gram positive bacteria or gram negative bacteria. And gram positive bacteria get different antibiotics typically than gram negative bacterial infections. So, to know what type of infection someone has, you would do a gram stain if you were a clinical microbiologist in lab. Now, to just back away a little, Gram positive bacteria, when we look at that class of bacteria, they have a thick cell wall, and that uh, cell walls are made up of peptidoglycan. I'm going to do a gram stain lecture video later, but just to, to kind of simplify, gram positive bacteria have a thick, thick cell wall. The cell wall is made up of peptidoglycan, and when you stain them with a the gram stain, they stain purple. So an easy way to memorize this is gram-positive bacteria have a lot of peptidoglycan and they stain purple. So PPP, positive, lots of peptidoglycan, stain purple. Gram-negative bacteria have a very thin uh, a cell wall made up of peptidoglycan and they also have an outer layer, so they stain red. So just remember, gram-negative bacteria stain red and gram-positive bacteria stain purple. The reason why this is important is if you take a urine sample and you do a gram stain in lab and it ends up looking purple, you know that that person has an infection with gram positive bacteria, so you would give them the appropriate antibiotics that treat that. So the reason why the gram stain, again, is a differential stain is it differentiates bacteria as they're either gram positive or gram negative. Gram positive bacteria stain purple and gram negative bacteria stain red. Acid fast is another type of differential stain. And with the acid fast stain, we classify bacteria as either acid fast positive or acid fast negative. So some bacteria have a waxy material in their cell wall and the gram stain does not work on them. And I'm gonna teach you all about this in the secondary stains lecture. This is just the first lecture to give you an overview. We use this stain to classify bacteria as either acid fast or non-acid fast, or you can say acid fast positive or acid fast negative. 
We use the skein when we suspect that someone has an infection with a mycobacterium species of bacteria. So example, um, tuberculosis is caused by bacteria. It's specifically caused by the bacterium mycobacterium tuberculosis. This bacteria, when you suspect that someone has a tuberculosis infection, you would get a sample from them and you would do an acid fast stain in lab. If the bacteria do stain as acid fast positive, they are red, and bacteria that are non-acid fast are blue. So with mycobacterium tuberculosis bacteria, they would stain red, and you would say that the patient does actually indeed have a myobacterium tuberculosis infection, and you'd give them the proper treatment. So these bacteria, again, have mycolic acid in their cell wall, so the gram stain doesn't work on them, so that's why we do an acid fast stain in lab. And I'll teach you all about the acid fast stain in the staining lecture, but it's basically you take your, if you have a sample, I think you got um, a lung sample or a sputum sample from someone, you would put it on your slide and then you would add your primary stain, which is a hot pink stain. I will teach you about this later. You would fix the cells on the slide using heat. Then you would remove the stain by washing it off and you would add a secondary stain. The cells that held on to the primary stain are acid fast positive and the cells that did not are non-acid fast. So this is the acid fast stain. And then finally, there's a group of stains called special stains. So we use special stains to distinguish parts of microbes. Um, some We're going to learn all about this in the prokaryotic cell structure uh, video. So you're going to learn about structures of bacteria. Bacteria may or may not have these structures. So some bacteria have a structure called flagella. Flagella is a structure that helps bacteria move. You can do a special stain on bacterial slides using a flagella stain, and the flagella stain stains the bacteria's flagella. Some bacteria have a structure called an endospore. Endospores are these very, very resistant structures inside bacterial cells that help them withstand very unfavorable environments. So there's something called an endospore stain that we do in lab, and the endospore stain stains endospores. So you can see, does this bacteria form endospores, yes or no, by doing the endospore stain? You can tell, um, are my bacteria motile by doing a flagella stain? And then finally, some bacteria have a capsule, which we briefly talked about, and you're going to learn all about it in the lecture on prokaryotic cell structures. But a capsule is this gelatinous um, material outside the bacteria. And so there is a stain that we use to look at capsules, and that is a type of negative stain. So it doesn't really stain the microbes. Capsule actually stains the background. And so that's what the capsule stain is, it's a type of negative stain. So this is the end of this lecture. And the main thing I want you to get out of this lecture is that microbes are very small and bacteria are measured in micrometers. Viruses are measured in nanometers. The light microscope lets you see things in micrometers. The electron microscope lets you see things in nanometers, things that are very small, microbes that are very small. With the light microscope, there are different parts. I want you guys to know the function of all the parts. So like, what's the function of the condenser? And we talked about magnification and total magnification. Remember that the magnification of the ocular lens, this is where you put your eye, is 10x. There are four objective lenses, so know the magnification of them. And the total magnification is objective lens times the ocular lens, which is 10x. And know that we use, we can get contrast by using different types of the light microscopes, such as dark field microscopy or fluorescence microscopy. Dark field microscopy are when we is when we have a dark background by using an opaque disc in the condenser. Fluorescence microscopy uses a fluorescent microscope to look at fluorescent organisms. Another way we can get contrast uh, when we're looking at transparent organisms is through staining. There are simple stains, differential stains such as a gram stain and the acid fast stain. There's special stains. So special stains are stains that stain 
a special structure such as the flagella stain or the endospore stain. And then finally, there is negative staining. Negative staining is when we stain the background, such as what we do when we're trying to look at the capsule of bacteria. So I know this is the first lecture, so it seems overwhelming, but it will definitely get easier as we talk about these things more in detail.